off of the CCAC to order. It is February 21st, 2022, and obviously we're doing this via Zoom. Uh, so hopefully all of you got a copy of the agenda. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Nope, all right, so we will move on. Um, next is discussion of the minutes. So I believe that Steve sent out a um, draft of the meeting minutes from January 11th. So um, we will be voting to approve those at our next in-person meeting. For now, it's just, is there any discussion items related to that? Any uh, changes, corrections, additions? Nope. Okay. Um, then the next bit is the community engagement um, public outreach survey that is being presented by the Jones Edmonds team. So Steve, uh, I'll turn that over to you to figure out, um, I don't know who's presenting, so. Okay, I think, Alec, are you presenting first? I am, so I will be presenting and Madi will be assisting. Yeah, absolutely. All right, you should be able to share your screen if you like. Right. And um, when you're ready, go ahead and introduce yourselves for everyone. Certainly. Great. So I am Alec Bogdanoff. I'm uh, the principal and co-founder of Brazaga. Um, we are on the Jones Edmonds team. From my team here today, we have Mari or Maria Del Mar, um, who is really the um, workhorse behind the survey for you all and our survey expert. And then also from the Jones Edmonds team, we have Brett Cunningham with us here today. Wonderful. And so we wanted to give you all a brief um, overview of where we are on the survey. We know that this was something that was really important to this group. Um, and then we actually have a draft of the questions and wanted to kind of get some feedback with you all. Um, we will tell you now that there are a lot of questions um, because as we've built this out, uh, the list kept growing. And so one of the most important things we really need from this group today is some direction on the questions that you all feel the community will, that will help most guide us um, and the community will um, most be help most helpful in providing feedback on. And as soon as my mouse reappears, wonderful. So um, we really developed the survey to understand their experiences with climate change, what it looks like and feels like to them, how they're experiencing the impacts. Um, most um, most community members don't necessarily even understand how they're experiencing it. So some of this survey is to not necessarily um, ask them directly about their climate change experience, but experiences that um, come from the impacts of climate change. We want to know what stakeholder think, think should be done to address these concerns. This is really important. Um, we want you know this to be a community-driven process. And then who should be responsible for the actions? And so you'll see this through the questions when we go through them. So a quick up outline of the survey, we'll do introductions, we have some demographic questions to really understand who is filling out the survey. We wanna understand their quality of life and future risks, looking at experience, concerns, and impacts, their level of action, their level of knowledge, and some of their values. And then we wanna talk about adaptation strategies. So prioritize concerns, prioritize adaptation strategies, and prioritize critical infrastructure. And I would be remiss if uh, I went any further and didn't really acknowledge the staff and folks like Stacy who have really been um, intimately involved in helping us develop this draft for you all. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure working with this team. Um, and frankly, the uh, it's it's wonderful to work with folks who are dedicated and care about this topic and really want to provide input. So I do want to um, thank you all. And so when we're looking, what are we looking at in terms of climate related impacts? We want to look at critical infrastructure, agricultural production, groundwater and surface level, surface water levels, wildfire frequency and energy needs during extreme heat or cold temperature events. Um, you know, for those of you who, um, uh, you know, have plants and care about them, I, a couple weekends ago, was helping my um, family cover plants in Gainesville um, when I was there visiting uh, for the extreme cold, which was, I think, the first time they had had to do that in a couple of years. So, um, it's definitely something people are thinking about and talking about. They're just their experiences aren't necessarily being related to the topic of climate change. And something to note that you guys are also 
unique in that you're really one of the first inland communities to do a full vulnerability assessment in Florida. And so this is going to be different than a lot of the community vulnerability assessments that have been done previously, because most of them really focused on the coast and they focused on sea level rise and storm surge. So this will be different. And obviously, so a lot of the questions will be different as well. So in terms of engagement strategies, we want to think of um, who we're going to collaborate with. So what departments, obviously this committee, and then build out a stakeholder list. We really want to focus on equitable feedback, which means um, ensuring that we figure out how to get feedback from those we don't often hear from. Some other things um, to think about are um, using the data, use of the data already established and making sure that um, we figure out ways to reach historically marginalized populations. So thinking through what surveys have already been done, who do we not necessarily hear from? Um, talk about points, who the point of contact is for additional questions. We're talking about some translation opportunities for the survey, specifically in Spanish language, and then a definitions page, because one of the biggest challenges we find in surveys is oftentimes uh, you ask a word and people don't necessarily know what that word means, which means that they're not offering the feedback on that question that you really need, um, because they don't necessarily know what the words in that question mean. So in terms of dissemination, um, obviously the county website, online survey, so we can get QR codes that can be put on flyers. We want to do paper forms to ensure that those who may not have access to internet can help fill out the survey. Um, counties, flyers, banners, newsletter, mailing lists, and media partners. So we're going to try and get this out to a lot of different places. And then in terms of engagement opportunities, um, we just always, if there's key locations that a lot of people um, go to, that's always great. And then if there's uh, community events that we can, you know, uh, piggyback on if the county's already doing engagement uh, to kind of have a QR code waiting and say, hey, do you want to fill out this survey? So we're going to work with the staff team to find those opportunities and really make sure we get this survey out there. So we're going to finalize the strategy, the strategy and some next steps. We want to really, uh, we're going to finalize the survey, sorry. We're going to co collectively finalize the stakeholder list, make sure we get this out to as many people as we can. Um, we love going to community partners and utilizing their listservs as well and bringing them in. We want to really identify who has been the marginalized communities in, uh, who, what community members have we not heard from as much previously, and figure out how we can engage partners to really reach out to them. And then again, identify key locations for events and survey distribution. And so we wanted to kind of talk with you about our engagement strategy before going through the survey itself. So I'm going to pause here, let you guys provide some feedback before we go into the survey. Alex, uh, this is John Nix. Uh, Alex, when, when you opened up um, with the objectives, I think one of the objectives is to specialize in, in marginalized communities is to make sure that they understand what climate change is. Uh, we, we talked about how it affects you, but I'm not sure everyone has the same definition of what it actually is. And it would be good to get to start out with a common denominator on um, what climate change is. I, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, we have some basic 101 um, climate 101 materials we can we can put together and provide. Um, one of the things we wanted to do with the survey was though um, understand people's um, where they are in terms of their understanding of climate change because one of the things that helps us understand is what solutions they're thinking about. And what we've seen when we work with other communities is oftentimes um, folks aren't necessarily opposed to solutions because they're opposed to climate change, but they're opposed to solutions because they don't understand the connection to climate change. And so by being able to understand, we, we will be doing education, but I think for this survey, we wanna start with understanding where people are and not necessarily giving them all the information so we can really understand um, where they are in that education process. But I think that's a great idea at the end of the survey, we can get some climate change 101 materials and say, yes. hey, if you'd like to learn more about climate change, uh, here's an opportunity to do that. And, and it's and it's not necessarily just the definition, but 
what is climate change in your day-to-day -day life? Uh, you know, the, we, our extremes, you, you know, that, that just basic definitions of extremes. That's really helpful feedback. Yeah, I'm, I'm making lists and I'll, I'll circle with um, Stacy and her team and we can, we can figure out how we can do that. Yeah, if, if, we, if we start out with, rather than uh, thinking about climate change in a scientific way, but thinking about it in a impact way from a day-to-day -day definition of extremes. Yes, and when we go through the survey questions, I think you'll see uh, that that's really our approach. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, team, do you want me to just go ahead and call on folks or does the staff want to? It looks like you guys, um, I think James, um, I saw Jenison's hand up for a moment. She took it down. So James, why don't you go ahead? And then Jenison, if you still have a question. And then it looked like Maria also had her hand up, I'm assuming to respond to, to that. So we'll go ahead and unless Maria, is your, do you have a response directly to John? Um, I would just say that once you go through the survey, you're going to see that definitely that is our approach. Um, one of the questions that we are trying to include is also assessing their knowledge. And so we're doing a little bit of a metric on knowledge because sometimes people think they're more knowledgeable. Um, as we share with Stacy, um, people think that they're more knowledgeable, they fully understand. So we kind of set a little bit of a metrics there to give us an idea of where people are standing. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll see that approach throughout the survey. Patty said it a little more eloquently than I did. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Maria. Uh, James, go ahead, please. So thanks for putting this together. Uh, just a question slash suggestion about methodology and how you get the survey out to people. Uh, have you thought about doing snowball sampling where you incentivize people to share the survey with their friends, family, neighbors? Um, and the way that I'm thinking of it is for uh, some fraction of every individual that they share it with, uh, they get, you know, entered into a, a raffle or something. Um, as long as the person that they share with has a unique telephone number or address or something, you don't want people gaming it, uh, but you could create a system so that people are encouraged to to share it with people that they might not otherwise have access to. Um, just an idea. I think that's a great idea and we'll talk with staff about that. I will tell you from experience, one of the hardest things is just tracking it. Um, mm. if, you, if any of you have uh, tools you've used previously that make it really easy to track that, we'd love to kind of hear it, but uh, we just haven't found uh, the best tool. So it might be a good opportunity to get UF to do like a hackathon or something. Hmm. And if I can add to that, sometimes you can track it, but it is the authenticity behind tracking it because maybe you could just put, did somebody refer you to the survey, but that doesn't 100% give us the authenticity that that response is actually a new person. So we also wanna be mindful of that. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was thinking like requiring that the person put you know, a telephone number, an address, um, something that they can't fake too easily. Uh, but yeah, no, I get it. All right, Jenison, did you have something to add? Um, I, I was just gonna add in response to John's comment um, that I know early on I was, fortunate enough to get to meet with Stacy and Maria and um, Alec to talk about the survey early on and that, um, you know, one of the things that I know they've been very careful about is that framing it so that we don't have, so that we don't turn people off, potential respondents off, because we want to have feedback from a broad, you know, range of respondents throughout the county, not just in the city. And that if you use the terms climate change right up front, it can, that could like, we could lose a whole subset of potential respondents who are being impacted. So um, 
that's all. I just want to give that context. Thanks, Jennison. Uh, does anybody else have something to to add before I throw it back to Alex? Nope. Oh, all right, Alex, back to you. Great. There's um, there was a question that someone put a Q and A in the chat and just wanted to flag that for you. Did they? I don't think I. Did they not put it on in the regular a, chat? No, it was a Q and A. Sorry, in the chat. There's a Q and A in the actual Q and A of the Zoom. Mm, somebody want to read that while I try to pull up the window? I can read oh, it if you want. Sure. See. Oh uh, yeah, I got one. All right. So per John's comments, there's a NNO CCI training. Um, how to give very clear knowledge. You can circle back to Megan Ennis for helping in framing information in brief paragraph, explaining heat, storm intensities, et cetera. She's active in the arena. Okay, that's coming from Ellen. All right. Okay. That's actually a really good point, um, reaching out to the folks involved in Noki. Great. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is um, pass this to Mari to go over, to walk through the questions where we don't wanna walk through all of them in detail just because we know that this will take a very, very long time to do so. So what we're gonna do is kind of talk about them in groups, um, give you a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish because right now we have 18 pages of questions. Um, and I think what the feedback we're really in need of at this point is to, um, if there are questions you all say, that might not be that helpful. Um, if you could put in the chat or just kind of let us know, that would be helpful. If you put it in the chat, just put the question number um, and we can provide some feedback or if folks wanna provide oral feedback, that's fine as well. Um, just kind of raise your hand and we'll watch for that. All right, Maddie, take it away. Thank you, Alec. I think an easy way for us is to keep track, like Q dot the question number and then the dash. Um, and then you can submit your final comments so that way we maybe have them grouped. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go over the survey and what we've created so far. We have the introduction. We definitely want this to be a 10 minute uh, survey, but we understand that some folks may want to express themselves and really give us some details of already of how impacted they've been. Um, so we also create that room for them to elaborate, but being mindful of the 10 minutes. So Alec, if you can please scroll down. So the beginning is just really understanding demographic. Again, some of these questions you may have surveyed before. So if you do find questions that are too similar to previous surveys and recent, it may not be necessary for us to have. Um, if you go to question 15, we were talking about having um, one more down, question 15. Thank you. So we had this as a like art skill, right? Um, and here is where we, some people don't really know how climate change or like what are the impacts of climate change. So we kind of try to put them into these categories. Um, but something we can do um, is just kind of create an open-ended question. The problem with creating just an open-ended question is, again, those folks who have no idea what climate change impacts are may not know what to respond, and they may be experiencing some of this. Um, so we do want to create a difference here of what is experience and what is a concern, because you may not have experience um, extreme heat, but you do worry about some relatives that work outdoors and you may be um, worried about your kids, right? So we wanna create that difference between experience and concern. Um, if you do find some uh, questions that could be broken down or tied into, we definitely suggest you let us know. Um, but again, we're trying to bring questions that are for everybody, for the whole entire demographic, including farmers. Um, so if you may scroll down to question 17, 
we had Maddie, some... I just I, I do want to just flag for folks. Um, this is still a draft survey. One of the things we will do before it goes live is send it through copy edit. So you may see small like this isn't capitalized or commas missing. Um, all of this will go through a detailed copy edit before it goes live. So I think here, in, thank you, Alec. Um, here in question 17, we kind of formulated that metric of knowledge. Um, but again, we're always open to suggestion. If you think there's a better way to assess this, this is just uh, what we are suggesting. Um, and I do think it's important to get that knowledge, right? To understand how much people actually know about climate change to make knowledgeable decisions. Um, so in this regard, I would say, let's keep 17. Um, and if we may move forward to question 20. Thank and, you, so question. And, sorry, I just, Stacy, um, I had just a general question for you on, on getting feedback um, on whether we want to be able to share this and let folks provide feedback or we wanna get all the feedback today just so everyone's on the same page. So Steven sent out a copy that was very close to this. Actually, it was okay. the same version that I edited. It's just You just didn't see my second edits, everybody on the CCAC. So this was sent out to everybody last week, I think on Thursday or Friday. So people do have this and I would think that we can also accept emails after this meeting. I know some people probably haven't had a chance to read it. So, I mean, I think collecting feedback tonight would be good. And then Alec, you can let me know when would be a good deadline if people have additional comments to get them to us and we can. Sure, I think sure if we can, and this is, I, I just realized I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page on this. So I think if we could solicit feedback by Friday, that will allow us to, um, you know, finalize this next week and aim to um, launch this as soon as we can after that. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm happy again. I think feedback via email is fine as well, because I know folks may want to review things in more detail. And Maddie, I'll send it back to you. I just want to make one comment to Steve. Sure. Um, if any of the CCAC members have comments on the draft, send it to me and I'll route it over to the, to the team. Thank you. Yep. That would be helpful. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm just going over some of the comments, the last few comments that we received. So question 20, I do agree we can delete. Again, we're also waiting for additional uh, feedback if, if you wish to provide it. Um, as well as question 25, we were also thinking about uh, deleting that one. Um, because we can ask, for example, what does uh, climate resilient Alachua County look like to you? Um, we can incorporate that in one of the questions that we have below. So again, if you find some questions that you like more than others and you can combine them, um, that's kind of where we would like you to let us know. Um, question 29, please. And I think I, I just want to share with you all again, we want to have that difference between what is experience and how concerned you are about something. Um, and could Delise just have questions above that talks about concern? So yeah, the reason why I said not necessarily delete this question, um, because we also want to know how supportive people are about adaptation strategies. Um, and here we wanted to know if this is feasible for the county as well. We don't just want to give you adaptation strategies. Maybe some of these have already been implemented. Um, like we said, the fertilizer ordinance, so congratulations on that. That's awesome that you have it implemented. So some of these you may have already implemented that maybe we're not aware of or maybe in the works. So we can um, shop some of these adaptation strategies. Um, and then if we can move to question 30. Maria, can I jump in really quick with a comment here? Yeah, go ahead. On, um, I also looked through this and I noticed a lot of repetition and I understand where you're coming from saying that you want both experience and concern, but you promised people a 10 minute survey um, and it's annoying to be asked the same question over and over again. And so if your difference is literally a word, have you experienced this? And then a list of questions in later in that same survey, are you concerned about this? And then the same list of questions people are not necessarily going to understand your intent. They're gonna think that they're being asked the same thing twice and they're gonna shut down. They're just gonna be like, this is annoying. You didn't read your survey. Um, I, I already answered this. And so I think that we need to be 
um, really careful, although we want to get all the information that we can, we need to be really careful about how it's going to be read and making sure that the respondents understand that they're being asked a different thing, or if there's a way to gather both of those pieces of information without literally asking the same question, minus one word different twice, I think that we would probably be better served doing that. And, and I think some of the feedback we wanted to receive from you all today was we know this is survey is too long. Are you more concerned about impacts or are you more concerned about how, you know, attitudes? And so some of it is we, we want guidance from you all is what you feel, what information you feel would be most helpful for you all to continue your work, um, as well as what we, we feel would be most helpful to continue ours. I, I agree. Um, sometimes there's, the questions are already so uh, detailed. It's, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, even merge more things and then you're worried about oh is this too complex but um are we're happy to we we want to have that conversation today that's really why we're here and stacy has her hand up so i'll let her chime in yeah and that's why i'm suggesting delete them it's not that i don't think they're important it's just in trying to cut it down and i i guess i'm erring on if we have to cut somewhere when we're asking people to recall their experiences sometimes it's hard for people to remember everything. I don't remember what I had for breakfast today. So that's why when I think about like concern, because someone can stop and say, okay, am I concerned about that? Whereas like when we're having to remember what has happened to us, I feel like we get less accurate responses, but that's just my perception on that. Absolutely. And, and again, that's, we, we were here today for that feedback. Um, as I was walking out the door this morning, I was trying to find my cell phone and it was in my hand because I was talking to someone. So, you know, uh, definitely understand that. <laughs> I think there's awesome. also overlap. So if you ask somebody, are you concerned about something? They are going to be most concerned about something that they have directly experienced, even if they can't tell you exactly when they experienced it. So I think that answer, asking one version of that question is going to get information about the other, even if you're not explicitly teasing it apart. Awesome, yeah, happy to. Um, and then one thing I would um, note, because I know there was a, there were a couple comments in the chat. Um, just if there, I agree. If there's a time frame, one of the things we'll add is some qualifying language to the questions. We um, once we have the questions, you know, the next set of questions will ask you about your experiences. Think about a time over the next, you know, previous six months where this might have happened. So we we do add some of that introductory language once we settle on the questions and we group them. Um, and then I think we've already talked to Stacy about um, potentially running this through some of our Jedi community members, and we'll continue that conversation. Um, and then the last one for James, we do worry about getting biased surveys because what we found is that um, the most knowledgeable people tend to be the ones who fill out the survey, which is why we ask the questions about knowledge base, because we really want to be able to segment those who are very knowledgeable about climate change and those who aren't to see what their differences are in the solutions or their willingness to um you know uh focus on solutions or you know potentially look at other funding opportunities to fund some of this work so we agree and and are really that's one of the things we focus on so i think one we've question sorry um so like for uh question 15 did you want to broaden the impacts to, 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 to include others that are close to the person being asked? So to what extent do you agree with the following? I have been able, or I've been unable to go to walks, but I don't have a dog, right? Um, I do, but you know, just say that I don't have a dog, but my mom has a dog. So do you want to make it, um, you know, your family or close friends? That's, no, that's a great, I, that's a great point. And I think that's the type of question where we'll, it'll get cleaned up and it'll say, you know, instead of it saying, I, you know, to what extent do you agree with the following statements that you or someone you are close to have been, and then we can kind of break it down. So we're going to, again, these questions get cleaned up over time. It's, it's very iterative. Um, but that's a great, I, I think that's solid feedback and we've, we'll definitely um, in, include that. Can you all go back to the exact things you want to, okay. So um, that is a great question. I think that was one of the things we wanted to get feedback and that's really going to help us figure out what we're going to cut is, you know, this survey came out of our quest from the CCAC. So we wanted to really know what would be most helpful for you all in continuing your work. Um, for us, I think all of this information will be helpful as we continue the vulnerability assessment, but we wanted to make sure that 
um, we understood what you all wanted from this survey as well. And if I may add to that, the adaptation strategies, we don't just want to include adaptation strategies that may not work for the county. Um, and again, some of those that may have already been in the works. And to add the last um, question about assessment about climate change, we do have that question 30 that assesses the knowledge of climate change. So that kind of just gives it away and that you can determine more or less uh, how knowledgeable the, you know, the respondent is understanding just um, greenhouse gases and climate change in general. Yeah, I had a comment on that. Um, in a Venn diagram, D and E are a subset of C. So that's pretty confusing to someone who does this for a living. And I imagine that it would also be confusing to other people since um, one burns fossil fuels to generate energy and one also burns fossil fuels in order to transport goods and services using internal combustion engines. So I would just prefer that we kind of clarify that a little bit so that those are clearly yep. separate things. Maybe just electricity consumption, um, transportation, and then take away burning of fossil fuels since that um, is also how we construct buildings and how we do a lot of our agriculture. So it's actually kind of a subset of all of it. Thanks for that feedback. I do agree with you. That makes a lot of sense. I'm sorry, Jennison, you had your hand up and I just jumped in. <laughs> Please go ahead. No, I think I put my hand up after you started speaking. It's okay, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, Alec, what you said about wanting to know what we want to be able to say. And I think broadly, overall, I think we need to make some decisions about what we absolutely need to answer versus what would be nice to know, but we need to, but we we can ask it later or in a different format because um you know the respondent burden obviously is going to be high if the longer the survey is we're going to get less input um and i think i don't personally know and i'd love to hear what the other committee members think but i feel like the knowledge measuring knowledge is not an outcome that's as actionable and it should be taken out. Like I, I would take the knowledge measurement out completely because I think from my perspective, what we're trying to understand is how are people experiencing the impacts of climate change and what are the um, resources and opportunities to you know, address those impacts in our community, like what are they and and how, and then sort of tangential to that, but still critical is, are you willing to support, you know, policies that fund these actions, even if, you know, means your taxes are gonna go up. So I feel like there's just too much, it, it's too, we're trying to answer too many questions um, in the survey as it is. And so, um, I'd want to hear others' thoughts on that. And Christine, I know, has her hand up too. Sorry, Christine, go ahead. I'm, uh, I'm not gonna call on folks unless, unless like we get a, a log jam, right? Like you know, you all can see it too. So you know, if you know that you're up next and you have the you know comment, just like hop on in. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Jenison. I think that we need to, this, this survey would be most useful if it's narrowed down into understanding, tr trying to understand people's concerns and, and what, what impacts they feel like they may have had and what are their, their climate-related concerns. Um, and then I, I feel like they, we could ask more broadly if they would, support certain actions, but I think that the purpose of this in my mind was to just kind of collect the concerns and and uh, what what they've what they have 
experienced or fear to experience and then and what their concerns are and then from that as we go through this process then later we can figure out what types of management actions might be put into place that they would accept we could ask some broad stuff like that but i think that this is just needs to be narrowed down to current concerns and potential impacts and i think um this is all great feedback so thank you so much for being so honest uh, about how you feel about the survey um i just want to highlight question 26 that i think um this is probably it's going to give us a little bit of an idea of how concerned people about are about future impacts and then um we can work this through and try to incorporate some of the questions that we have in Question 18. Yeah. And, and one thing I will say, we've we've gone through this a couple different ways. We've done Likert scales, we've done pick the top three and then build this out. So um, you know, one thing if if you all are concerned this might be too much, we can do, hey, select the top three you're most concerned about. That still generally will give us an idea of what the top ones are. Um, this allows us to really look at it on a threat by threat basis. So we actually get a lot more information um, doing it through a Likert scale. But again, um, you know, you always want to weigh the complexity of a survey with the information you're going to gain from it. And so that's an important thing that, you know, we wanted feedback on tonight as well. What what is your research um, shown you on grouping the threats together and asking the series of questions related to specific threats? So instead of having a bank of questions related to it and have all the threats in each bank of questions, which may seem redundant, ask about a certain threat and then run through the these questions. Does that make sense? Yes. And we've done it both ways. Um, frankly, the results haven't necessarily changed much. What we find is when you're it when we're focused on a few narrow threats, it's easier to do it threat by threat. But when you're trying to look at a broad range of things, it uh, ends up being cumbersome and we get actually a lot of fall off when people feel like they're being asked the same um, set of questions on a different topic over and over again. So we just try to balance it. Um, again, you know, we're asking a lot right now. We know that we need to break it down to a 10 minute survey. Um, I think in this case, given just the range of threats you all are looking at, um, I would recommend kind of trying to focus more on all of them at once and seeing what's important. And then if there's one or two that you all really want to focus on, let's say we know that, you know, uh, he, extreme heat is really important. We can ask some specific questions about extreme heat. I, I think it's also Im important to maybe identify what solutions are what things are out there right now and asking if they're familiar with cer certain things that might be helpful toward a certain th threat that's available right now. Or, or how to resolve it if, if, if they feel that, how, how, would you, how would you handle, how would you handle flooding? Do you know how to handle flooding in your community? What, what would you do? Uh, and do you have a specific threat that you feel would be most impactful? impactful. Yes. And do you, do you have one that you think in, in Coralachia uh, that would be? I, I, I think uh, one, one of the ones would, would be uh, power outages and, uh, and in, in, in certain areas. Uh, based on the uh, equipment that's that's there. Uh, my second one would be flooding based on drains, uh, clearing of drains. So John, to make sure that I understand your, your question, so are you suggesting having a question, and this is going to just average citizens saying like, what would you do during a flooding event? Or right. Do you know what's available to help you in a flooding event? All right, yes. Or if if you're uh, uh, 
it, doing doing a situation where you lost power, uh, how how long do you think you 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 could? When would it become a big problem for you? Two days, one day, that that kind of impact. How long do you think you can do without power? <laughs> Fifteen minutes. <laughs> And and and, I, and I'm saying that because uh, with experience, uh, I've probably been through like eight or nine hurricanes, and it and it varies so much on the different actually um, places in Florida. Uh, East Coast Florida is different from West Coast Florida. Uh, you know, rural is different from uh, uh, um, urban communities. So you know. When does it become a problem to you? Or have you seen flooding in your area and how has it impacted you? Another opportunity that we do have is to break it down by those threats, right? So just dividing the question simply by extreme heat, flooding, um, cold fronts, just really breaking it down. Yeah. Um, and that way we can measure their experience and perhaps leave it open-ended for the severity. Um, I, and they can I like that. It. Great, then we can probably formulate some questions parallel to what we have and we can send them out for you guys to review. And it's a, it's a little bit more direct, I think, when you do it like that, people can kind of relate a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. it's something we do. We've, we've worked with both ways, right? We've done like the like art, we've also divided them in like different sections, so. I, I agree that could be an, uh, an opportunity as well. Yeah, Maria, I was thinking along the same lines that John was saying too about, um, I think being able to simplify like uh, the question 26, I think framing it by those broader impacts and maybe something like like a series of questions about, you know, that that's getting to their level of concern, but also how prepared they feel to um, respond to, or how safe, I'm trying to think of the right words, but uh, you know, like how, how prepared do you feel personally in the event of, you know, an extreme heat wave, um, you know, severe flooding, power outages for extended periods of time, like very short, but you know, distinct events that we know are occurring more often. And, um, and just like, you know, do you feel, I'm, think, I'm thinking about this, you know, from my perspective as a citizen and as a mom or whatever, like personally, there's, there's a certain level of security and resources available to me under those circumstances. But then when I think of our community more broadly, that's a whole different, that's a whole nother, you know, yes. question. And I wonder if we want, if, if what we really want to get out of this is an understanding of, you know, for vulnerability, like that personal perspective as the, as the hook you know, to keep people going, but then um, the perspective in terms of how secure do you, you feel we are as a community in responding to or equipped, you know, how well equipped are we to respond and bounce back from these kinds of events? Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. I, I have to apologize. I, I feel like I have total brain fog. I've recovered, our whole family had COVID. And I'm like, so I, I apologize for my long winded sentences. And if they don't make sense, I feel like my brain just isn't making sense. <laughs> so I'm sorry. That's no, a good just, segue. I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree uh, on, on those two categories, personal uh, versus community. And, and it's, it's kind of a two different things. Uh, you know, when you don't have gas stations available or you don't have food in, in your community and you have to travel across town to get uh, food, it, it, it's, a, it's a different thing. 
some people might have you know stored food they might have had ice so so that personal part might be on a personal pr preparation where in that community part would be do you think that there's systems in place to to make things no to reduce the impact Yes, exactly. I agree with I agree with both of you all. That's ex I think that's a great way to try to capture it. I have a thought and a question. I mean, one, I think it's great that Jen is here from emergency management because there might a lot of these questions that have been brought up right now are about preparedness and you know emergencies. So there might be you know I encourage you, Jen, to look at this. If there's anything that would help you in your planning you know, we can, we might be able to tweak things to make it more useful for you. And then um, getting at focusing on those actual like impacts, like the flooding, you know, energy, heat, things like that. Are you thinking, Maria, that maybe you would ask at the beginning, like top concerns, and then if people say three, then you ask them follow-up questions on their three, rather than have everybody answer all these questions for 10 or 15 threats and that way different people are getting different questions and they're just getting them on the ones that they thought were the top. We, we could do that um, potentially. Yeah, sorry to answer. I was just thinking through the um, software to make sure that it's possible. Um, I'm pretty sure, Maddie, we can, we can do that if, correct? Yeah, you would select your top three and then leave an open box for like other, then you can just elaborate further to that. Um, and again, I think that would be helpful to limit those responses. And for people that may not have experienced anything, they may not want to share additional comments. Um, and then we can also reword question 31. Um, so that one talks a little bit about what services or places they, they find helpful um, after they experience some um, you know, rainfall events or um, storms. All right, are there any other questions from CCAC? There, are you guys, um, Marty, are you able to see the chat? Are you guys able to capture that? Okay, because there were some questions and some, some comments um, in the chat that are relevant to this. So I just want to make sure that you all are, are capturing those also. I, 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 have, I, I was going to say, I've copied and pasted all of them, so I have all of the chat questions so have we answered what the necessity the most important questions to answer are for the survey <clears throat> because right now the survey questions are there's 41 and a lot of these are very long um <laughs> so I, I don't i for my own clarity i don't know that we've really established which topics we want the surveys to be designed for i mean maybe you all have i just don't understand but um just, it, yeah, I think it would be helpful for the survey uh, people putting it together to give them, you know, bullet points what they need to address. Yeah, I think um, I, I think for us, um, what we've found is you guys are really focused on on what they've experienced or what they <clears throat> feel to experience, and then focus that more towards solutions. So we're gonna. Um, we're going to rework this and um, I have some, and I think the, the last comment was really, uh, I think Stacy brought it up to, I think what we'll do is we'll focus on a few threats based off what folks think are they're most concerned about and um, really use that to drive solutions. So um, I think we have some really good direction. It's really helpful. Um, and I, I'm, I, I feel a lot, I, I feel this was very helpful in, in gearing the survey towards what, what's helpful. I, I just want to say, I, I think that approach has another positive part. It depends on what part of Alachua County and which community you live in is going to determine what you think your threats are. So I, I think that that would also give some segmentation to it. Thanks. Yeah, and if I may add to that, I think we had created some questions about ranking. So just name your top three. And that just kind of gives it away of what are your top three concerns. 
um, and maybe narrow the, the ones that we currently have. Instead of making like a like art, we just kind of get an idea from what those three top concerns are. Three or five, could be three or five. Yeah, and I, I think that ranking would be really helpful. Um, and I've used in surveys that exercise where you know you just list seven, not too many, but list enough and other and have them drag, you know, the top three or choose the top three. I know you don't want to have it be completely open ended because that's a nightmare trying to categorize them. Um, I, I did want to while the committees together and everybody's on the call. I wanted to ask Alec and Maria to comment on because on the sequence um, with how you move the demographic questions up to the beginning, which is not typical, you know, typically they're at the end. And you had explained to, to yeah. me why you did that. Um, but I I still have concerns about losing a whole segment of people. Like, I understand why, but I'd like for the whole committee to kind of hear the explanation of that because I, you know, I worry about people seeing those right away and then just not not wanting to participate. Like, I, I would rather yeah. have the answers to the questions and then have them leave and say, I don't want to give you my demographics than have nothing at all. So. We, we've we've just found, and one of the things, um, and I'll, I'll give another option too, one of the things we found is that if you put the demographic information at the end, a lot of people will just kind of leave and not ever give it to you. And so that does create some challenges when we're trying to segment this out and understand who's filling out the survey. So our approach is we put it at the beginning, if people choose not to fill it out because they're asked for demographic information, um, in, in, a lot, in our opinion, a lot of times that's better than not having the demographic information because then you have a lot of um, responses that you don't really know who's who's giving them to you. Um, one of the things we can do is, um, and uh, th this is an approach we've done as well, is what demographic information is most important, ask a couple of them up front, and then at the end say we have some additional demographic information that we'd like to ask. Um, originally, we didn't have as many questions. The list of demographic questions has grown quite a bit. So I think we do need to go through and pull the ones that we think are most essential to um, our survey and then put the rest of them at the end of the survey. So I think we will end up bifurcating that. And that's a really good point, Jenison. We just, uh, you know, as I think we started with four um, and now we're up to quite a bit more than that. Uh, can I also offer a, an alternative to that? Of course. Instead of just offering one or two questions, um, can you make it a question where it's essentially a drop down where you ask, are you willing to share dem demographic information? And, you know, they can click no. And if they click no, none of those questions even appear. So in terms of that reaction of like, oh, they want all this information, you can click choose not to answer, choose not to answer, choose not to answer. But if it, we're worried about people even, you know, being like surprised or put off by the questions at all, just saying, are you willing to share demographic information? And then you know, say all responses are completely optional. And then if they click no, they don't see the questions at all. If they click yes, then you get that drop down. We can do that, but my experience is when you ask people if they want to give more information, is ninety percent of the time they say no. Well, not more information. Are you willing to share demographic information? But I, I guess any of those questions, what we found is. Most of the time, if if folks have an option to say no to giving you something, they will say no. Unfortunately, but you're giving them the option to say no. They just have to say no a dozen different times to each and every demographic question. I see what you're saying. Like because prefer, not, prefer to not to answer each question. I saw oh. like, prefer not to answer. Prefer not to answer. Prefer not to answer. Sure. Yeah, we can absolutely provide that as an option. I thought you meant like one overarching, but that. No, I, I do. Think... No, what I'm saying is like this, this argument that, well, people, if you let them opt out, they will opt out. You've already given them the opportunity to opt out. You've just made it a little bit harder by having to choose prefer not to answer to each one of those questions. Because prefer not to answer is an option on most of the demographic questions, at least on the drafts that I saw. Mm -hmm. I could see, yeah, I could see benefits to doing that 
both ways. And I like the suggestion of splitting them, like put the two very most important ones up front and just be very candid, you know, it's important. Like there's a reason we're asking, I mean, you know this from survey research, but like there's a reason we're asking you this and, you know, your information's not gonna be linked to you. So, um, but Megan, I think the, the sequence of doing that, like if that were the first question I saw, just saying, would you be willing to share your demographic information? I'd be like, it's just strange to see, like it almost raises a red flag for me, like, oh, like this is sensitive or, oh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm just would, you that really, would you be willing to tell more information about yourself or would you be willing to share information about your household? Would you be, you know, it doesn't have, you don't have to use the term demographic. I'm using it here simply because it's kind of a technical conversation. I mean, I feel like the questions that are most relevant to us, and I, you know, feel I would like other people's feedback on this, but like we want to know what community they're from, you know, to John's earlier point about segmentation, we really want to know that. I don't necessarily think that that, necess that should be even in the same category of what's your household income, what's your education level. I think that, you know, where do you live is a different category of question. And so I think that like splitting that out to be something that's not even with those other demographic questions, and that is really critical to our understanding of the data would be a more useful approach than lumping household income, education level, you know, gender, racial yep. identity, and where do you live? You know, I yeah, I, I to totally pick agree. out what we really want. That that location is critical, and the way the first question is like just have people enter their area code, or I mean their zip code, <laughs> not area code. You know, like up front, like we need to know that for sure, um, but yeah. No, and, and that's and that's really helpful for you, but um, one of the things I will say is, um, yes, this is like the language in here isn't necessarily as approachable. That's the last thing we do is we go through in a deep dive and, and rewrite everything. So it, you know, there's no technical language. We run it through readers um, and actually the survey it software we use itself um, actually flags words for us if they feel they're too technical. And so by the time this survey is completed, it's, uh, you will see a published version that is different than what you see now and we'll have that reviewed as well. Megan, I think that's very valuable insight uh, that you provided. So I think definitely leaving the most important demographic questions at the top and then maybe asking that question, would you be willing to share more information about yourself or your household? And we can just leave it at, at the very end. Jenison is probably the better person to ask about what, well, Jenison and John, maybe, um, what do we think are the most useful, what we're calling demographic bits to really be pulled out and highlighted at the top. And, and Stacy, I will um, leave it to you, just knowing um, zip codes are sometimes odd boundaries. If that is help, like looking at the zip code map of Alachu, I think you all would have a much better uh, handle on whether that's helpful um, or not. We've definitely found zip codes helpful in our landscaping surveys for sure. But we typically only get it from some people because it's that last question of whether they're willing to give us contact information and a lot of times that zip codes in there. I'm not sure on timing for tonight, does the CCAC want to hear about the implementation plan and provide some feedback there, or is, or is this enough for this topic for your meeting tonight? Um, I think we really want to be respectful also Jen, who's here to give her presentation. So I don't know, Jen, how much time do you need? I, we had kind of had split this up, or in my mind, I split this up as sort of like this conversation about the surveys, the, the first hour, and then your presentation on the second hour. So I wanna make sure that since you joined us, that we don't encroach on the time. Yeah, so I think my presentation is maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and then I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. Awesome, okay, thank you. So CCAC folks, um, do we want to take another maybe five or 10 minutes to 
discuss this implementation plan or do we want, I guess Stacey, is that something that we could put off for a month or is that something that like we need to, the Jalen Dedman's team needs feedback on it, you know, ASAP? If there are details on it that could be sent out since we're sending feedback anyway by Friday, maybe that's something we can read about, read, read through and then comment on. Is that an option? That is absolutely an option. And I, I think that given the plan, that would probably be most helpful if you all will get it to you and then you can provide um, feedback via email through Steve. Yeah, that'd be great. I think in that, Alec and Murray, if you need any, like if there's specific community groups or stakeholders that you're wanting, like the CCAC to help us fill in, like, you know, do we know the names and emails of people that, you know, or events where we can take this. If you're wanting specific stuff like that, put that in whatever you send out so that we're only sending one, we only have one ask. Review this plan and provide us any key people that you know of. Great, we'll get that out tomorrow. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for the suggestion, Adam. Yeah, and Stacey, to, to your point, we definitely want to build that database the outreach database collectively. We don't have the answer of all the groups and participations in your community. So we can create a living document so we can expand. Great. Well, thank you all for having us today. This was really helpful. It was a pleasure meeting you all. Um, and we look forward to future engagement as we continue this really exciting project for the county. Thank you very much, Alec and Mike. We appreciate you coming and presenting and, and listening to our feedback and taking it to heart. We'll see you all soon. Have a great one. All right, sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you so much, all. Have a good night. All right, CCAC folks. Um, let's go ahead and take a five minute break. Um, so come back here. Uh, it'll be at 714. <laughs> um, 7.13. Uh, and then we'll hop right into Jen's presentation on the emergency management plan and um, go from there. All right, see y'all in about five minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brett. Stacy, should is it alright if I stay and listen to the plan, or or would it be better just to have the? No, I think. I think that would be fine. And I'm, Stephen, I'm going to turn my video off because I need to figure out what I'm wearing to a conference. I'm leaving my house. So I'm going to listen in, but have my video off. So let if you need help from me, maybe shoot me a text or something. I'll do that. Yeah. And Brett, stay on if you're, if you'd like to. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think it would be helpful for you as you're working on the vulnerability analysis. So yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely love to hear what's said. Great. Okay. See you in a few.
If you are back, go ahead and turn on your video so we know who's back and ready to go. If you can, thanks. All right, looks like we're still waiting for a couple of folks to get back. So let's give them a couple more minutes. All right, looks like most everyone is back. I see Adam saying that he's actually back just doesn't have the camera on. So Jen, if you are ready, I will turn it over to you. I just wanna first say thank you so much for being here with us. Um, Steven sent out the emergency management plan last month um, and then again this last week. So hopefully all of us have had a chance to at least review it and be kind of familiar with the topics that are covered and your approach to everything. And we really appreciate you being here and, and talking us through the work that your department has done and giving us the chance to, to ask questions and, and maybe offer a little bit of feedback. Thank you. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jen Grice. I'm the Director of Emergency Management for Alachua County. And uh, I'm kind of just gonna give you a very high level overview of emergency management. There are a million different things we do, but um, hopefully you've had a chance to at least uh, browse our comprehensive emergency management plan, but I'll kind of hit some of the highlights of what we do. There we go. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about uh, some of our mission areas. So preparedness, mitigation, response and recovery. And then lastly, I wanna talk about some of the things that we've actually had impact Alachua County in uh, recent history. So our office, we are four staff. So the director, which is me, we have an assistant director, and then we have two emergency management coordinators. So uh, very small staff for um, you know, the amount of things that we do do. Uh, we, we fall within Alachua County Fire Rescue and we are co-located with the Alachua County Sheriff's Office Combined Communication Center um, off Hawthorne Road. So um, we're within the Emergency Operations Center and then the other half of the building is the Communication Center where your 911 calls come in. So uh, first I'll talk about preparedness and this is really where we live most of the time. Uh, it isn't uh, so frequent that we have uh, disasters uh, with the exception being COVID, which has lasted for quite a long time now, but really we spend the majority of our time preparing for those things, those acute incidents that, that we will experience in our community. So um, the first thing is EOC readiness. Uh, EOC is Emergency Operations Center, um, making sure that our facility, which is quite large, is ready at a moment's notice to stand up to coordinate any incident that we may have. Uh, and next, and this is really the biggest thing, is uh, planning, training, and exercises. Uh, we are an all hazards office, so all of the planning and training that we do is geared towards anything that could potentially happen. Um, you know, we're, we're not just the hurricane folks, we're, we're wildfire, we're mass casualty pandemics, uh, you name it, that is what we are planning for. And then within all of those activities is really incorporating the, the whole community. And on the next slide, you'll, you'll see the amount of people that we coordinate uh, with. So if you had a chance to look at our comprehensive emergency management plan, you probably saw these agencies in there. Uh, everyone here has a specific role 
within uh, our emergency operations team when we activate for an incident. So uh, just looking at this list, you know, it's everything from the sheriff's office to the University of Florida as a liaison or the IFAS extension office. So everyone really plays a part in uh, making sure that we can uh, get our community whole again after uh, we have a disaster. So some of our other big preparedness activities, one of our core functions is alert and notification. So being able to notify our residents and visitors in a timely manner that um, something has happened and those protective actions that they need to take. And we have a few different ways that we do this. The first is a program called Alert Alachua. And this is um, within our Everbridge notification system. We're able to, for individuals who have signed up, we're able to notify them either via text message, phone call, or email to get them that critical update on the emergency. Uh, if it is something uh, really severe and, and time sensitive, we are we do have the ability to send a wireless emergency alert. So most of you have probably had one of those on your phone before. It's that very jarring tone. Um, typically, uh, Amber Alerts are, are a common one that, that you'll get on your phone. We actually don't send out the Amber Alerts. That's uh, law enforcement, but uh, we do have the ability to send out wireless emergency alerts for um, specific incidents within the county. And then lastly, this is something new that we've just started this year as part of our preparedness campaign is uh, the concept of an ACR. If, I don't know if anyone here is, is an ACR, if they know what that is, um, an Alachua County resident, but here uh, within our office, it means being Alachua County ready. So we kind of took that, that double entendre and one of the things that we've done is uh, created a, a text campaign where you can text the word Alachua to 888-777 and actually receive uh, updates when we have an incident. So you're not going to be alerted if there's a, a thunderstorm or something like that. But when we're activated for say a hurricane and we have shelters opening and um, perhaps there are, are curfews or government closures, that's the sort of things the, the high level text messages that you would, would get if you were signed up for that. Uh, some of the other stuff that we do within the preparedness realm uh, is a special needs registry. And this is actually required by Florida statute chapter 252, which is really um, the doctrine for emergency management within the state of Florida. So uh, the special needs registry, is just a registry of any individuals within Alachua County who have special medical needs. One of the biggest ones is if they have an electric dependence or they're dependent on oxygen, those folks need to make sure that they are somewhere that has continuous power, so a generator. So we, we have those folks on this registry and we reach out to them to make sure that they have a way to, to get to a special needs shelter that has that power so they can maintain their equipment throughout the storm. Uh, another thing we do is healthcare facility plan review. So for any healthcare facility that has overnight stays, so thinking about nursing homes and assisted living facilities, and even our, um, our two big hospitals, uh, UF Health and North Florida, they all submit those plans to us for, for us to review. And then the, the last thing that I wanted to mention on this slide is this is something we're working on right now. And it it somewhat ties into to what you've been talking about tonight, and it's uh, a FIRA, which is Threat Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. This is a, a huge undertaking that my office has just started um, in January. This is actually going to be a year-long process for us, and, and I will say most emergency management agencies do not do a FIRA because it is so involved and labor and time intensive, but this really looks at um, talking with all of our stakeholders, so uh, all of those folks that you saw on the previous slide, and uh, addressing what our current capabilities are, 
based off of what our potential hazards are and then recognizing what those gaps are. So that's one piece of it. And you know, this time of year, we, we really focus on meeting with all of our partner agencies before hurricane season. So one of the things that we're incorporating into those meetings is asking them those questions about what are your capabilities given X hazard? So I think your survey is potentially addressing some of the other things that we're not getting from our Thyra, which is citizen input, because ours is really coming from our emergency operations team stakeholders. So I'm really uh, interested to hear um, our residents' thoughts on their vulnerabilities and you know what our challenges are here in Alachua County. All right, so moving on to, to mitigation. Um, the biggest thing that we do, the base program that we have within mitigation is our local mitigation strategy. There are a few different components to this. So the first is the actual plan, our, our local mitigation strategy plan, which uh, it has a ha hazard vulnerability analysis within that plan. And once we do get the thyroid done, the thyroid will actually replace the HVA that we have in our LMS. So the LMS currently is our guiding document for identifying the hazards within Alachua County. And then the LMS also uh, addresses strategies to uh, combat those hazards. Uh, another component of the LMS is the actual working group who, who helps write this plan, um, set the priorities for, for what the working group uh, is going to focus on. Uh, and a subset of that working group is actually the project ranking task force. So the working group is made up of uh, several, actually, I believe all of our municipalities, uh, our universities, some, some other agencies, and they're all able to submit mitigation projects um, that they would like to get funded. So they submit these projects and the project ranking task force actually goes through and based off of different criteria, you know, cost benefit analysis, how many people does this actually help? Is it, is it one or is it a huge community? Um, you know, what is the feasibility of this project? So they take all of that information and score the projects um, and put them on that, that ranked list. That ranked list is then used for these mitigation grants we have here. So the first mitigation grant is the HMGP, which is Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Uh, this grant is only available after a federally declared disaster, so a, a declared disaster within Alachua County. Um, to my surprise, we actually received HMGP funds for the COVID-19 pandemic, even though it wasn't a, a natural uh, disaster. They, they did actually give every county in the entire country HMGP funding for that because every county uh, nationwide was declared. Um, so, so that's the, the first mitigation grant. Then the next one is BRIC or Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. And this is really one that is nationwide and it's very competitive with not a very large pot of money. Um, but that is available for mitigation projects. And then lastly, flood mitigation assistance. This is another one that we uh, recently submitted applications for. Um, the applications we submitted were to uh, acquire residences that were um, susceptible to repeat, repetitive flooding. So it's a, a buyout grant that, that we uh, applied for and, um, if we were to get it, uh, the properties would be demolished and then no one could ever build on those properties again. So the, the last mitigation thing I wanted to talk about, and this is one that I'm, I'm really passionate about sheltering, is our shelter retrofit program. This is, the shelter retrofit program is actually run by the Florida Division of Emergency Management um, and counties are able to apply for this funding to retrofit uh, existing buildings to be used for shelter space. So the current projects that we have in Alachua County, we're retrofitting the Alachua County Freedom Center to, to gain that extra shelter space. And then we're also retrofitting a couple buildings within Grace Marketplace so that those, those folks, if we do have a high wind event, they don't necessarily have to, to leave campus to be safe. 
Um, some previous projects are the MLK Center and Sydney Lanier. Um, one of the things that I really try to do when uh, looking at buildings to retrofit is look for buildings that are not schools. Um, if we have any parents on this Zoom meeting, you know it's a huge impact to the community whenever you have to close schools. So I really try to, to look for our non-school facilities if, when we do have to open shelters and open those first so that we can at least delay school closures for as long as possible. Um, and lastly, I'll note that there, there have been some legislative changes to this program uh, this year. And we they've actually changed it so that this funding is available for buildings pre-construction. So you can actually get that funding um, before the building is built, which is a, a nice change. And I'm going to take a look at some of the future construction projects that we have and see if any of those make sense for, for mitigation. All right, and then response. This is kind of what everyone sees on TV, but doesn't happen uh, as often. Uh, our response is really guided by our comprehensive emergency management plan. It really sets the framework for, for that countywide response, including our organizational structure and roles and responsibilities uh, within the emergency operations team. Um, if we do have a large enough incident, we would activate our emergency operations center. Um, and really that's done in conjunction with uh, the multi-agency coordination and policy groups. So um, those, those high level officials in government um, having a conversation with them about activating the emergency operations center. And if we do activate it, then we bring in our emergency operations team to actually coordinate the disaster. So here's our organizational structure. I won't go through everything, but that policy group I mentioned is up here. And then you'll see this is the director's staff and there's a position that uh, liaises with all of our municipalities and constitutional officers. And then down here, these are just all of the different functions that we have to account for uh, when we do have an incident within Alachua County. I will say that this structure is uh, flexible and scalable, so we won't necessarily activate all of these positions for every incident. For, for example, during COVID, we did not activate ESF-9 search and rescue. So it really is incident dependent um, who we activate. All right, so for a response, um, the phrase all disasters are local is really one that, that we use all the time in emergency management. Um, you know, it starts here in Alachua County and even if the state and the feds come in, at the end of the day, it is still us. It is still our community and, and our responsibility to, to make our community whole or bring it back to its new normal. Um, we do that uh, within the EOC by coordinating the people, things, and informa information needed to uh, support accomplishing those incident objectives. One of the biggest thing is with resources. So uh, there is a, a flow of resource ordering and everything really does come through the County Emergency Operations Center. So if the city of Gainesville or the city of Newberry, if they need something and they can't get it um, within their own agencies, they have to come through the county emergency operations center to, to request that resource from, from outside of the county. Um, if we can't meet the need locally within the county, we reach out to the state to, to get their support. And typically the state is able to help, but if they're not, they will kick it up to the feds or FEMA to, to hopefully fulfill that request. Um, and, and just a note on our emergency operations team, we, we are not first responders. We are, uh, we like to make that distinction. You know, some people who do sit in those seats in the emergency operations center may have a first responder job in, in blue skies, but uh, when they're in the emergency operations center, it, it is a, a critical thinking role, making sure that everyone's able to, to get the resources and the support needed to, to help those, those boots on the ground. Uh, and lastly, I'll just mention when we do have an incident, the uh, LachuaCountyReady.com website is where 
We share all of our incident relevant information for, for public consumption. Uh, this is kind of underscores what I mentioned about the flow of uh, responsibilities and resources. All right, recovery. So recovery is really the, a lot of times the forgotten part of the incident, but it, it lasts the longest. Um, you know, the, the news crews leave and no one's, no one's following up. Uh, you know, we don't know what's happening in other communities because the news is no longer there telling us about it. But um, for those communities where something has happened, uh, they are dealing with that incident for months, years, and even decades. Um, I lived in New Orleans when Katrina happened. And, you know, I go, I try to go back once a year or every other year. And there are still things about the city that it's, it's still recovering from Hurricane Katrina. So, and that was 15 years ago. So it can take quite a while for a community to completely recover from, from that disaster. Uh, some of the other things, especially in uh, the immediate uh, weeks and months and years after a disaster is addressing those unmet needs. So housing is a big one, you know, um, whether it's individuals displaced who are from Alachua County or if it's individuals who have been affected in our coastal communities, their, their homes are no longer viable and they've come to Alachua County, um, making sure that they have housing um, if they've been impacted. And then food, this is another huge one. Um, food insecurity after a disaster is a, a very big problem for many folks. So making sure that we're able to provide food to our community or get them money or resources to, to get the food themselves. Um, another thing is connecting uh, residents with assistance, whether that's FEMA or the Small Business Administration. There's also disaster or DSNAP for, for individuals who, who need food. So some of that assistance is dependent on a federal disaster declaration, but we, we do what we can to make sure that we're able to, to meet those needs and get that assistance to the community. Um, and then lastly, just debris management, getting everything cleaned up and those mitigation projects I talked about, those post-disaster mitigation projects to uh, make things a little better for the next time. All right, so now I just wanna briefly talk about some recent incidents. I don't know how long everyone has lived in Alachua County, but I will, I will start this by saying we have not had a hurricane hit Alachua County in a very long time. If any of the storms I'm going to mention were bad for you, uh, it hasn't actually really been truly bad here yet. You know, we haven't had the, even the category one. So um, just keep that perspective in mind when, when thinking about um, what we have had happen and, and what potentials are. So 2016, kind of the, uh, the seal was, was broken on no hurricanes after a decade. And, and we had Hermine, which was a, a Gulf Coast storm. Uh, it was a tropical storm at best for Alachua County. Uh, we had 5.6 inches of rain and the winds and all of these wind, wind totals that are on these slides, they're from the Gainesville airport. So um, take that with a grain of salt. That is kind of an open field. So it does get a bit windier there, but it gives you an idea of kind of how strong things were. Um, but Hermine, really, there were a ton of downed trees, and it's probably because our trees had not been shaken out in over a decade. So Hermine really kind of uh, cleaned out our, our foliage, and we did activate shelters for that storm. Uh, later that year, we had Hurricane Matthew, which was on the Atlantic side. It was more of a, a storm for the St. Augustine Jacksonville area. It was also a tropical storm at best and was less of a rainfall event than Hermine um, with just 20 mi 29 mile an hour sustained winds and 42 mile per hour gusts. So those, you know, those numbers, we've had bad storms roll through here on an afternoon that are stronger than that. 
Um, fewer down trees, probably because Hermine did her thing with the trees the, the weeks prior and we, we activated shelters for Matthew as well. All right, and then Irma was really the biggest one that we've had in, in recent memory. That was in 2017, so a year after those storms. It impacted Alachua County as a tropical storm and it did pass right over us. Um, the wind readings were 40 mile an hour sustained and then 50 mile an hour gusts. This was really a, a huge rain event. This was not a, a wind event for us. The, the flooding was really, really bad for, for Irma. The Santa Fe River was uh, flooding. There was one point where we were doing contingency planning because we were worried we would have to close down I-75 because the, the water was getting so high. Um, additionally, Payne's Prairie flooded. I didn't know that it could look like that, but uh, it can. And, you know, that was another road closure. 441 was closed for a long time due to that flooding. So, uh, again, Irma was a smaller storm, but uh, the category of storm doesn't necessarily equate to the other impacts of the storm, primarily rain. You know, you can have a tropical storm, a la tropical storm Elsa that we had uh, in the summer of 2021, that can drop a ton of rain and cause more impacts in your community than a storm that's a wind event. So something to keep in mind, obviously water is a, a huge, huge issue. Flooding is, is a big problem. And, you know, the, the rainfall that we can get with a hurricane is definitely significant. Uh, lastly, with Irma, I'll just mention that it was our largest sheltering operation that we've had in our history. Uh, we opened some close to 20 shelters, probably about 17, something like that, just a lot of shelters. Um, the next incident, and this I've, I've included some of these to you know move away from hurricanes to show kind of our all hazards, uh, was the Richard Spencer speaking event, which was also in 2017. Um, I, I honestly don't remember if Richard Spencer or, or Irma was first because it was such a crazy time, but we did have both of those in the fall of 2017, and that was really a very large planning effort with the university and all of our public safety agencies. Um, ton of resources brought in to assist our community. And then lastly, COVID-19, which was really the, the a big, big incident for us. It was a 27 week emergency operation center activation. Uh, the longest activation in Alachua County's history. It was a marathon and a sprint at the same time. Um, for our emergency operations team, really the, the biggest thing that, that we did was deal with consequence management. So Florida Department of Health in Alachua County was the lead agency for the public health side of the pandemic. So, you know, everything related to, to vaccines, contact tracing, proper public health information, that was all the Department of Health. But then there were all those unintended consequences of this pandemic. For instance, the food insecurity. So folks, they're, they're homebound or, or they're afraid to go to the grocery store to get food, or they don't have the money to get food because they, they lost their jobs. So making sure those folks could actually eat during this pandemic. So we did, we actually did a, a food delivery, which is a reverse model from what we normally do in emergency management, where people come to us uh, in lines. We, we actually brought food to, to the people, uh, which was quite a large operation. And then we also assisted with a lot of other food distribution efforts that were the, the typical drive, drive through style. Um, and then another big thing that, that we were doing was providing good information to the public. You know, there, there were a lot of question marks within our community surrounding uh, the pandemic. So it, it fell to our uh, public information officer to make sure that that we were consistently putting out good information and, and sharing resources uh, to our community. And then the, the other big thing with COVID was 
uh, a lack of isolation or quarantine facilities for, for some individuals in our community. So a lot of our, our homeless folks, when they did test positive for COVID-19, they did not have somewhere safe to, to isolate uh, with their symptoms. So we actually started the non-congregate sheltering program to, to put those individuals in hotel rooms so that they would have a, a safe place with food to, to, to wait out their, their COVID symptoms. And they were, they're monitored by medical professionals and, and checked, checked on daily. So that was another very um, logistically uh, intense operation. And then lastly, just the concurrent disaster planning that, that we've done throughout this pandemic. Um, you know, how do we respond to a hurricane when, when there is a pandemic? What changes do we need to make to our sheltering operations? Are we still doing the normal 20 square feet per person or do we need to look at a higher allocation of square feet to account for um, social distancing? So a lot of considerations with, with COVID-19 um, and doing that concurrent disaster planning. So I think that's all I had. I know I didn't talk too much about climate change, but I, I think it's really, it's, it's wrapped up into everything for us. So uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, yeah, you may not have said the word climate change, but a lot of what you talked about absolutely is related to climate. So um, I'm gonna, I see Stephen has his hand up. Anybody else have a question, feel free to raise your hand or we seem to do a pretty good job earlier at just bouncing around conversationally. So also feel free to to just you know jump in, try to be respectful of you know who's handling it first. All right, Stephen, please go ahead. Hi, Jen. Uh, I'm really grateful for your presentation. It was uh, really good, and it gave me a, an overview of, and I'm sure the rest of the committee feels the same way, of just how extensive uh, your operations are. Uh, I'm somewhat amazed that you're able to pull all that off with the, the small number of people that you're working with. So congratulations, and I imagine you go home sometimes pretty tired. <laughs> uh, that having been said, could you speak to a, a little bit to the climate change issue explicitly in terms of stationarity? We do know that looking in the rearview mirror is not a good indicator of, of the extremes that we may experience. And the literature is full of uh, uh, those projections of what those extremes might be, not just for extreme storm events and extreme uh, rainfall events and that sort of thing, but also to uh, the movement of vectors associated with, with disease and, and that sort of thing. Is that a, a discussion that you guys have had? And what sort of planning is, is there to address this uh, lack of stationarity. Stationarity is when you ex you project what kind of disasters you're going to have based on, uh, say, a 50-year average or a 20-year average or a 100-year average. And insurance companies use this concept, uh, but they've basically thrown it out the window. They've said it's no longer a valid concept. We need to be looking at the projections in the scientific literature to come up with our, our um, our uh, cost tables. So thanks, I'll, I'll shut up now. So um, from the county emergency management perspective, one of the things that we are very uh, acutely aware of is just the, the increasing frequency of disasters as a, a result of climate change. So um, really looking at what those consequences look like, um, you know, it's not going to affect all of our emergency support functions, but what are the things that we're, we're seeing an, an increase of as, as the years go by? And, you know, some of the things that I mentioned, we're really seeing that, that increase in the food insecurity and then housing insecurity are, are really two of the biggest things. And, you know, one of the things that, that comes to mind is, you know, we're what's called a, a host county for the most part. So if we have if we have a hurricane, we are getting those folks who are the most impacted by by climate change. They're evacuating to Alachua County. They're they're staying in our shelters and perhaps not leaving after the disaster is over, you know. 
I mentioned that I, I lived in New Orleans during Katrina. If you talk to the city of Houston about what Katrina uh, did to their city, what it did was increase their, their population exponentially um, and then a strain on resources to, to meet that increased need of the population. So I'm very sensitive to that. And then the other thing I think about a lot um, is at the federal level, FEMA. Um, I've heard the FEMA administrators speak many times about the, the strain on that agency. So they have, they have more staff than, than we do, obviously, but it doesn't scale for the amount of disasters. And the FEMA administrators said basically that they are dealing with a new federally declared disaster, something like every other day, which is not sustainable from a federal agency perspective, and it's not sustainable at a state level or a local level. So I don't know if that answers the question, but um, hopefully it, it does in, in a roundabout way. Hi, Jen. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this. Um, you know, I, I was looking through at the um, hazard uh, vulnerability analysis. Um, and I know we're close on time here, so, um, but I'm just curious if there's additional data on how y'all pulled that together um, that we could maybe um, review just to see how you've kind of categorized each of these threats and quantified them. So I will actually have to talk to the, the gentleman who did the initial hazard vulnerability analysis to um, figure out what his metrics were for, for that data. Um, mm -hmm. That is one of the reasons we're doing that threat hazard identification and risk assessment is because uh, I think we need to update our, our look at our hazards um, because I don't have all of the, the information on how that hazard vulnerability assessment was um, created. Okay. Yeah. And my, you see, even kind of mentioned my follow on to it was is it looking at how the pace of these things are changing? So thank you. So I think with the, the Thyra, we will be looking at um, the pace of change of these disasters that is sort of incorporated into the, the questions that we're, we're asking our stakeholders. Jen, Jen I, I uh, also want to thank you. I thought uh, your presentation was very thorough and, and uh, I, I think it answered some of the questions, it, we just got to make sure that our community knows all the things that are available to them. And you mentioned uh, food insecurity, and you mentioned the fact that we kind of changed the, the way we did it in terms of going out to the people. How was that communicated? How, how did the people know that they could get the food and, and that was just one example, but how, how would we, how did you communicate to the to the community? So the majority of um, requests for food assistance were actually re received through um, an online portal that we have. So that was half of it was folks were, we had sort of a FAQ um, submit if you need help. So we had that and folks would, would say, I, I don't have food or I don't have money to get food. So so there was that side of it. And then there was also community support services. A, a county agency um, is tuned in to the individuals who, who do need assistance. And, and in their going out into the community, identified additional folks who um, were food insecure and um, needed a delivery. But I 1000% think that we can do more in um, the realm of communication. I think the, the digital divide is real and it's, it's very hard to, to reach everyone. You know, it, it was an online form and um, not everyone's getting online. My parents aren't, aren't getting online, you know? So um, certainly there, there is work to be done and I would love suggestions on how to, to better reach those, those folks who could use our assistance. Thank you. Jen, I just want to say I really appreciate your presentation as well, and I also really appreciated your personal experience, and uh, it sounds like you've uh, got personal and professional experience, and this really relates to what we're working on. I, I feel like 
with everything that's going on, the the reality of Gainesville becoming a host community for people who are climate refugees um, is real. And that's something that we really, really, really need to be paying attention to because there's so many people that are going to be fleeing the coast for, for various reasons, but sea level rise, large storms, the impacts, people are gonna be coming here. And it just, what resonates with me is the need for Alachua County to be thinking and the surrounding communities to be thinking of how to deal with our own disasters, but also be ready to um, accept and accommodate all these folks that are gonna be coming in here because we're one of the best areas in the state of Florida to actually be protected from these storms as you laid out and our limited impacts that we've had from storms recently, so. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think there's that, you know, a, acute part after an incident and certainly um, making sure that we're able to account for those climate refugees uh, in their immediate need, but also on a, a larger long term scale planning, you know, uh, smart, smart building, making sure that, that as we do build new communities that they're not going to impact other communities with flooding or whatever the case may be, but making sure that as um, we do inevitably scale up the, the size of our communities that, that we're not making things worse, worse on ourselves. Absolutely, and making sure that we have places that are affordable for not only our current residents, but also our future residents. Um, there's a lot of places that we, you know, we, we're going to have to really be able to be thinking about that forward thinking uh, as we, as all these things roll on, so. Absolutely. Dan, I had a question for you. So you've, you've been so kind to bring us this information about what you're working on. My question is really what do you think that we need to know? So in your presentation, you mentioned the recovery phase. And, you know, just now you guys are talking about the difference between sort of that, that acute emergency phase and then the longer recovery phase. A lot of the services that folks who would be climate refugees who might come to our cities as a host city, the services those folks need are similar to the services that the vulnerable members who are already in our community are going to need in terms of, of housing, in terms of, you know, food and water and that sort of thing. So having gone through that recovery phase with some of our previous disasters, are there things where there are, are gaps, you know, where we could be doing better? And is that something that, that we as a committee in addressing climate change that we can kind of work into our recommendations that we can, you know, be thinking about and working on to maybe fill in some of what is, you know, a little bit outside the scope of, of your agency, but it's still a need related to these sorts of weather and climate disasters. So the, the first thing that immediately comes to mind is uh, the gap in services when a disaster is federally declared and when it's not. So uh, when we have a federally declared disaster, folks are eligible to apply for FEMA assistance and get actual money to help them recover. Um, you know, if they're if they're uninsured, there there's money available to to help with the expenses with repairing their home. Uh, just a, a lot of opportunities. You know, there's uh, DSNAP, which is Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. I think I got that right. Um, so that's uh, money for individuals to to get food. You know, if your power goes out, you your everything in your fridge is bad. So and that's also available when we are declared. But then there's another scenario where we're not declared. So all of the resources are within Alachua County. So uh, one that comes to mind is Tropical Storm Elsa this past summer. That was uh, fine for most people, but there were some people in our community who were severely impacted, especially by flooding. And you know we we were fortunate enough we pushed to get a small business administration declaration which provides uh, low interest loans to folks but you're still taking on a debt at that point that you have to pay back to to make your home and your life whole again so to answer your question I think that the uh, amount of resources we have available to 
people impacted by disaster when we we aren't declared i think that um there's more to do there that you know um i don't know what that is precisely but that's why we're doing that assessment to figure out where we can improve um to to support our community thank you does anybody else have any questions for jen nope Jen, one, one of the other things that uh, you, you sort of highlighted, highlighted better communication. Do, do you think we could help? One of the things that we want to do is, is engage with community organizations and, and making sure that we use them to get things out. So um, I, I think that better communication uh, and, and working with your, your office making sure that uh, we're working in tandem uh, would, would really help and, and maybe communicating back to you some of the organizations that we have identified uh, that would help uh, leverage your, your ability to help the community. That would be fantastic. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. So, Jen, thank you so much. I really appreciate you staying up with us on a on a Monday night and sharing all that you have about the emergency management um, plan and the work that you all do and how you you both plan for and respond to disasters. It's been really helpful. Thank you all. You guys have been great. Uh, if you have any questions for me, just send me an email. I'm sure Steve or somebody can get y'all my email address. So, y'all have a great evening. Thank you, too. Thanks, Jen. All right. Let's see. We've got staff updates. Um, I know that we're kind of we're running pretty tight on time, so I, I think the rest of this is going to go pretty quick. But um, let's toss it over to Steve if you have anything on the county side. Yeah, and I think I might be the only representative for staff. I think you are. <laughs> Um, basically, we're, uh, I'll go quick. One is next week, next Monday, February 28th, is the Joint Water and Climate Policy Board at 9.30. Um, just a reminder, that's at City Hall now, not at the county building, and that's room 16. Um, so City Hall is at 200 East University Avenue, um, and that starts at 9.30, and uh, Megan, the chair, has a presentation she'll be giving on an update to them at that meeting. Um, Related to maybe our discussion later on the agenda for the next meeting, the greenhouse gas report is draft is complete and staff's currently reviewing that. We think we'll have that ready for your next meeting next month, which I think would be great. Maybe we can have a short <clears throat> presentation um, from Matt uh, Katz uh, from ICLEI who can give an update on the county's report. Just an FYI, the, the county sustainability manager position is still posted. Uh, that means we're still looking for more candidates. So that's going to be posted at least through Friday. Um, and then, and maybe Megan, we can talk about this later on, but uh, we'll need to decide for our next meeting, whether that's in person or not. Um, if it's in person, we'll have to decide where that'll be. Um, one, one situation is that Grace Knight is not available at our next regular Monday meeting on March 21st. We could use the auditorium like we did back in December, I believe, or November, um, and kind of sit around. If we do that, though, we probably couldn't set up Zoom. So that would we'd have to all be there in person for that to work. Alternatively, we could meet at the EPD conference room and in, incorporate Zoom into that meeting. Alternatively, if we meet the last Monday of the month, the fourth Monday, I believe Grace Knight is available. So um, maybe we'll pass that on or talk about that um, when we talk about suggestions for the next meeting. But that's all I've got. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Um, yeah, when we get to the items for the next meeting, that yeah, we'll have that conversation because I want to make sure that first that everybody is comfortable meeting in person. Um, I know 
you know, we're kind of on the downslope of, of Omicron, but it, there's still a lot of it. <laughs> um, and so just seeing if folks are comfortable uh, meeting in person, and then we can get into the, the details of where if we need to move it. Um, and yeah, so I don't see Tom or Justin, so that is, that'll be it for staff updates. I do not have an update on the um, climate change initiatives. There wasn't any feedback. So the document that you all saw last month is what I'm gonna be presenting to the Joint Policy Board um, at their meeting um, in a week that, that Steve just mentioned. So items for the next regular meeting. All right, so um, it's currently scheduled for the 21st. Let me pull up a calendar. If we were to switch dates, that would be March 28th. Um, I'm probably not going to be in town for that <laughs> on the 28th. Um, but if that, you know, if that works for everybody else, then, you know, then we can do that. Um, my current thought is that since we all have the day already on our calendar, then maybe we try to keep the 21st, um, since everybody already has it blocked off, and then we figure out um, a location. So first, um, any thoughts on in-person or virtual? How are we feeling? The, the, the purpose of in-person is to be able to vote on things. Um, and we had started trying to at least be in-person, um, you know, once a quarter, basically, so that we could, um, we could vote, we could approve our minutes, we could, you know, vote on any motions. If we wanted to pass um, a statement or a recommendation up to the policy board, that would be the opportunity to actually do that. Um, I saw in the chat, Ellen Siegel mentioned um, a possible topic for the next meeting, the climate director um, job description that's, apparent, that's being talked about for city of Gainesville um, and kind of the process for hiring that person. Um, that would be if that's something where we want to discuss it and then make a formal recommendation of any sort to the joint policy board. That's something that we would need to do in person in order to actually vote to approve a statement that gets passed on. Um, so how... How are we feeling about in person? My only input is just uh, that we use the facility that we could have a Zoom meeting for, because I think we've gotten a lot of good participation online. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for people to join us. So I, Steven, you said that you, you suggested a few possibilities. Um, Whichever one would be easier, more convenient to set that up. Okay. So the EPD conference room? The auditorium is available. That's the, the big, you know, that's where the cha where the commission meets. Um, it might be tricky to set that up for Zoom um, because I, I might be able to do it. I'd have to get communications office involved. Um, that would be the 21st. If you wanted to be in person, um, if we need, if we wanted an easier room to work, the twenty eighth in person in Grace Knight is a much more mm -hmm. functional room, um, and it's big enough. I think that most people feel comfortable. The alternative is the EPD conference room, but it is small, and would probably many of you feel very uncomfortable being in that room. So, um, I I can't guarantee if we stick with the twenty first. We would, we would be in the auditorium. I can't guarantee I could work out a Zoom situation for that, but I would try. Can we figure out who can make the 21st? Uh, I think that's Alachua County Public Schools spring break. And so I'm out. Oh, the 21st is. Yes. Making sure March 21st, yeah. Okay. Yeah, can Steve, could you set out like a, a doodle poll or something, the 21st versus the 28th? Yep. Okay. If, if I send that out, are we going to go on majority? Is that how we're going to work it? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I know that I'm, I'm probably like 90% not going to be here on the 28th, uh, but John did a wonderful job in my absence last time. So um, as long as someone is, I mean, actually, the thing is, if it's an in-person meeting, we need to have quorum. So uh, it's not even just majority rules. We need five people who are going to be physically present in that room in order for 
the committee for even to be worthwhile, right? We can't vote unless we have quorum. And if we're not going to vote, then we might as well not bother with in person. So I guess that's the question. Can we get five people on either of those days? Um, and I guess I, I realize that it can be kind of awkward to ask, like, how do you feel about COVID in a really uh, public forum like this? So that doodle poll would also be an opportunity um, if you don't feel comfortable being in person at all um, to be able to leave a comment in the doodle poll and let that be known. And that way it will be that's a, a more private venue than, than making a statement here. And so that way we can get a feel for, um, yeah, whether we can get quorum on either of those days. Okay, I'll add I'll add that to the doodle poll. I'll put a Zoom only option in there as well for both days too. That might be important too. So sounds good. All right. Um, anything else on this topic before we move on? Go to the doodle poll plan. All right. Uh, so, oh, and for the the next meeting, Steve, I thought the greenhouse gas inventory is a really good idea. Um, and uh, Ellen's suggestion about uh, discussion of the climate director job description, I think that that's also a really good topic for us to have an opportunity to provide input. Um, I don't know if, who we could get to give us kind of an update on where that stands. I know that it's been a suggestion that's been floated. I don't know if there's been any sort of formal announcement that this is something that is going to happen. Um, I feel like it was relevant to the conversation that we have, whether this is something we're like, oh, this is maybe a nice to have thing, um, or you know, we are planning to move forward with this. We're just really looking at implementation. So if there's any way to find out the status, that would be helpful. I'll inquire with the city staff what, what I can find out about that. So I'll keep that out of our notes unless we feel like it needs to be in the notes. Is that correct? The climate director position? Keep it out of the notes. I mean, it's, it's a possible topic for for next week. Okay. Or not next week, next. Next um, month. Okay, so I'll put that back. It's out. been publicly floated. It's not like a secret. There have been public comments made about potentially, you know, having this position. I, I have one other that has come up that Sue Blythe um, is interested in giving like a five minute presentation on community engagement in a short video. She's with the uh, Climate Collaboratory. Um, so she has asked if she could give a short presentation. Uh, she wanted it this today, but I knew this was a busy, Busy agenda, so I'd suggest it next month as a possibility. So that's another additional item if you guys are interested. I think that sounds good. I mean, communication, unless there's any objections, communication is something we're trying very hard to, to include in the work that we do. Yeah, I agree. All right, so those are, those are three. Greenhouse gas for sure. Uh, Climate communications for sure. And then if we get information about this climate director position, um, then put that in there as well. Yeah. All right, cool. So meeting recap and action items. Christine, can I toss it to you? Sure. Um, so we have updates. Uh, I guess we're going to. Let's wrap around on this one. So with the Jones Edmond survey, are we going to give them individual comments on the survey or how are we going to be giving them additional edits and comments? What's the best way for that? I don't think we wrap that one up. My suggestion is that you, you all send me your comments um, and I will provide that them to them. They can work through all those suggestions. Though they have the ones we've given in the chat and, and provided, but anything more, give to me by Friday and I'll provide that to them. Okay. Hey, Steve, can you ask that they show it to us before it goes live again? Because it was it was pretty rough today. Um, and I think that we would all feel, I personally would feel more comfortable seeing um, kind of what their final draft looks like before having it go live. Because there were a lot of not just like 
small issues, but really sort of like how are we organizing the survey? What questions are most relevant? And I think that we would, it would be beneficial for us to have a chance to lay eyes on that and offer feedback again before it goes out. I'll do that. Thank I would you. request at least one more round with that. I agree. It was very, very rough. Um, okay. And then with the emergency management plan, I don't, don't, we don't have any, we just, I don't have any updates on that or what we in any action items on that, unless you all saw something we needed to do. Is that right? Um, I was just hoping to hear from her if they had more info on the hazard vulnerability analysis. So I think she was going to look, Jen was going to look into that. Stephen, can you make it until Sunday? We're getting comments back. Can I? <laughs> I can. I can find out if that's a possibility. Okay. I, I started a new job with uh, FTAX. So, yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a B guy now. So, anyways. Ah. Uh. Uh, let's see, we're going to, there's a poll that's going to be sent out to figure out when we can meet, uh, March 21st to 28th, and it will determine our comfort level with in-person. And that's pretty much all I had. Um, was there anything I missed? Uh, sounds great to me. Okay. All nope. right. That does Thank it. you. Thank you. All right, so next is public comment. Um, I think I think even our night owls were dropping off. Um, if there's anybody, any members of the public who would like to speak, please raise your hand and we can uh, promote you to speaking role. I think I see Jordan is still in attendance. Jordan, if you'd like to, to speak with us, then please raise your little you know Zoom hand. Nope. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Um, so that will close out public comment and wrap it up. So we will um, see you going to be sending out the doodle poll for our next meeting. So please be sure to respond to that so that we kind of know what we're doing. Um, and with that, thank you, everybody. Um, Jennison, I hope you and your family feel better. <laughs> Uh, thanks for being here anyway, um, and I'll see you all next, next month. Well, probably, unless everyone's scattered to spring break. So. Bye, everyone. Good night. <laughs>